Mozart. I'm one of the co-founders of Arrival, and I'm looking forward to presenting a great session. And with me today is Liz Gilbert from Hornblower Cruises, Lauren McCabe Herpick from Local Food Adventures. Come on, Lauren and Liz. Thank you. Kelly McHugh from Pacific Whale Foundation and Gus Moore from the Miami Tour Company. So we're gonna jump right in and get a little intro of you guys. Uh, I wanna start with Lauren. Okay. Uh, just a quick, tell us about your product. Tell us about how many passengers you have each year yeah. and um, your distribution mix. All right, so we're gonna start with the smallest person <laughs> on stage. Um, so I own Local Food Adventures. I do exclusively food tours in Oakland, California and the East Bay of San Francisco. And I am gonna shock you all that I am gonna have my biggest year this year at 1,500 people. Yeah. <laughs> so. Woo. Very small, um, um, but I also do this as a working mom. So I literally work on my business 24 hours a day in my head, but I get four hours a day, four days a week when my kid is in preschool. Um, so I feel very accomplished, um, but my marketing mix is 90% direct. Um, so I've grown my business um, really just working directly with locals and getting them to book through me um, on my site, I would say 5% is through OTAs and the other 5% is Airbnb experiences. And we're gonna hear how she does that in a few minutes. Um, Gus, why don't you tell us about Miami Tour Company? Hi, uh, my name is Gus Moore and I operate a bus and boat tour company in Miami, Florida with my wife, Michelle. We met working at a restaurant together, waiting tables. Um, we saved up enough money and tips to buy two charter buses. 11 years later, we own nine luxury buses in our fleet. We do group tours around Miami and charters around the state. Um, we transport about 40,000 passengers a year. And our marketing mix is 70% direct, 30% OTA. So we've taken a little jump in numbers and Kelly, why don't you tell us about the Pacific Whale Foundation? Sure. Aloha. My name is Kelly McHugh White, and I'm visiting you today from Maui, Hawaii, where I serve as a Director of Marketing and Development for Pacific Whale Foundation. We are a mission-based organization that um, owns a social enterprise, which is a for-profit, called Pack Whale Eco Adventures, and that offers sunset sails, whale watching, snorkeling, um, concert cruises, with 100% of the profits going back into the nonprofit work that we do. And um, generally, we're about 60% direct, 40% third party um, during whale season. That flips on its head during uh, the summer months. And how many passengers? Oh, sorry. Uh, we serve 400,000 per year. 400,000. Yes. You get a trend here, what mm -hmm. we're doing? Um, <laughs> Liz, tell us about Hornblower Cruises. So thank you, that makes me the biggest person on the stage. <laughs> um, so Liz Gilbert with Hornblower Cruises and Events. Um, we are North America's largest dining, sightseeing, and transportation cruise company. Um, we move about 6.8 million passengers a year, and that's ferries, dining cruises, um, sightseeing tours, whale watches in Boston and San Diego. Um, our mix is a little different because we also have heavy group business. So 70% of our business comes from groups and 15% of that comes through travel trade or um, through online uh, channels as well as um, the, 50, the other 30% is individuals that come to us direct and 6% of that does come from the online travel. So. But you can do the math on yeah. 7.8 million. 6.8, yeah. 6.8 <laughs> million times the 30 percent times it, and yeah. it's still so a it's, lot. It's very, way more very, people than Lauren has. Yeah, yeah it's, it's <laughs> one very day, Bruce. One day. <laughs> so uh, if we can bring up our poll question, um, and while we're bringing up a poll question, if everyone could take out their phone and get into the app, we're going to ask you all, at least the operators in the room, what percentage of your sales are direct compared to third parties? So if you can pull out your phone and go into the app. You're in the theater, open up that room, go to interact, 
pick the room theater, go to the poll, and please let us know. And while you're doing that, we'll let you do that for a few minutes. Um, I want to talk to you guys about your mix between direct and third party and how you determine what's the right mix. I mean, you all have very different businesses, so you all have different strategies of determining what that right mix is. Uh, and I want to start with you, Gus. Well, we started our business a few years before the OTAs started working with us and, and helping us sell our, our products. Um, so we were 100% of the business was coming direct to us. When the OTA started reaching out to us and we put our, our tours on their website, I didn't pay a lot of attention to how much, they were, how much business they were sending us. Um, about a, a few months before going to arrival, I decided, hey, it might be a good idea to see how much these OTAs are sending us. We used to have 100% of the business direct. And before the arrival conference, I saw that the mix was about 50-50 and um, got really frightened by that. So, I had a little chip when I came to Arrival, a chip on my shoulder when I came to Arrival, um, and realized that I needed to revamp my business if I was going to continue to grow. I couldn't continue growing with the 50-50 mix. So, um, learned a lot at Arrival, came home, changed our offers, and over the last year have been able to get that up to about a 70-30 mix. Does that answer the question? Did I leave anything out? About your distribution mix. And the 70 is which? And the 30 is what? 70 is direct with us. The 30 is pretty much TripAdvisor and Expedia. So big swap. Yeah. OK. Kelly, you have a little bit of different kind of business with all of your passengers. It is. Um, direct is our number one priority for sure. And I think that's because um, I'm marketing director for both the nonprofit and the for-profit social enterprise, so we really need to utilize our brand to bring people into our family, not just as participants and passengers, but ultimately as members and donors um, and those that can support the work that we're doing around the globe. And we kind of fill in the pukas, we fill in um, capacity with our third-party um, OTAs. What about you? Okay. So um, for us, one of the things that we look to the OTAs um, and then how we go and direct is the OTAs feel a need for us. And we, although we like our passengers to come direct to us, we also realize they can get a reach that we can't get to. So meaning we only market in North America for search engine marketing, where a lot of the the people in the room are worldwide. And it, you know, although there is a cost to, with the commissions that we pay, um, that's really kind of where we look at the cost benefit of that, is how do we get to somebody in Germany where we're not gonna do search engine marketing. So we rely on them to get passengers that we, we're not gonna go after. And it does get a little fuzzy. We have some challenges when it comes to, you know, keywords or terms or branded key names. And we address them on a case-by-case -case basis, but, um, we really need that. We have a lot of inventory, and so they are an important, also marketing tool for us as well. So, so the reach is very big. All three of you work a lot with distributors, OTAs, and it's key that it's got to be incremental business. So talk to that for a minute. Uh, how do you make sure that what you're getting in these channels are incremental and not business that might have come your way anyway? Everyone's looking at me yeah. right now, so I guess I have to answer that question. Um, we, um, I, I believe in sort of planting seeds on the OTA sites. I believe in like writing bold descriptions, making strong claims, big promises that pique people's interest to come and search us out and find us on their own. So I'm constantly looking at our descriptions on the OTA websites, um, seeing what I can do to trigger people's imagination to wonder, is this offer too good to be true? I need to go find this out on my own. <laughs> so that's been my approach, to um, plant seeds on the OTA websites and encourage people to come and search us out and find us. Okay. Any other strategies for you guys on that? I think... Or thoughts about incremental? Well, I think that we approach them as a partnership. And not just a, it's not just a client, but we really try and be strategic and work with our account managers when we can. It's gotten a little bit more difficult in the last couple of years, but really look at need time and how can we work with them to help fill 
um, the votes when it's kind of off peak and kind of make sure that we're, we're both benefiting. So, you know, we work it daily as well. So there's three companies that have a lot of passengers, a lot of capacity. You really want to work with OTAs, distributors to fill that capacity because it mm -hmm. it's kind of can be unlimited, uh, especially for a company as large as yours. Uh, but what about the small people in the room? By not small people, small companies in the room. <laughs> I'm five uh, foot ten, Bruce. <laughs> <laughs> so you don't represent a small person, but <laughs> no, you do represent a small, small company. Not a small person. No. So small tell person. us about uh, from a small company perspective how you look at this. Yeah. So I think I was really fortunate. So when I started off, or started my company five years ago, so it was six months before I got pregnant with my son. I thought I'm a tour company. I should be on Viator, and I went on Expedia. And I put it out there. Um, I also actually started, they literally started my tour at the foot of one of the East Bay's most prominent hotels, thinking that is where I'm going to get my customer. And um, it was really slow. I wasn't really getting much traction. And so I did what a lot of new operators do. I did a Groupon just to get it out there. And while it killed me in terms of margin, I barely made any money, what I did gain was data. And what I found out was who my customer was. So I learned that my customer was a woman who was 50 years old, an empty nester, who was from Walnut, Ke Walnut Creek in Pleasanton, which is about 20 miles away from Oakland, um, looking for something to do with her husband or her friends. And so I didn't want to give any of my commission to Viator or <laughs> Expedia. So I figured, okay, I want them to come to me directly. So I just, I mean, I'll be honest, Bruce, the f I would sit up late at night and I would take, you know, I would Google search women's organizations in my area. So country club, women's clubs, um, the Junior League of Lafayette, California. And I literally stayed up and I wrote letters to them saying, I'm a woman business, um, come and do my tour. And I started getting private groups. And I learned, oh, this is where the money is. <laughs> and so I kind of have just kept that momentum going. So to answer your last question, um, because of Arrival last year, I have started a tour business or a tour that starts in San Francisco and that's really meant to be more of a tourist driven tour. So I look at that tour now as by my, my incremental tour. So my base tour is the locals who are looking for something fun to do. Um, I also knew the value. I come from the PR marketing world from my corporate background. So I know the value of SEO and getting referral links, and so I, I hired my youngest sister to literally put my tour on every online calendar out there, um, including Eventbrite. And so I have all of my tours on Eventbrite, and um, predominantly this new tour, the San Francisco to Jack London Square tour, I fill that tour about, I would say 40% of my guests from that tour are, are from Eventbrite. Um, but also, too, I started an ice cream and gelato tour. Um, one, I was eating a lot of ice cream when I was pregnant. Um, but two, because I also realized I saw who was buying the Eventbrite, who in my personal circle uses Eventbrite, and it's a lot of moms looking for something fun to do with their kids. And so that tour, the ice cream and gelato tour, gets a lot of um, Eventbrite. Customers. So when you first told me that, Lauren, I was like, yeah. Eventbrite? Are they a distributor in this industry? How many people use Eventbrite as a distributor? There's like four people out there. <laughs> um, so pretty fascinating idea if you want local people to participate in your tours, your activities, you should take a look at Eventbrite. Yeah. What's your distribution cost with Eventbrite? I mean, I pass on all the costs to the customer and they take out the little processing fee that I pay them. So it's, I pretty much, it's like a full, it's direct. It's a direct sale. It's a direct opinion. sale for you. Go in ahead. my opinion, yeah. Right, right. So something for you, that's, mm. check that off as uh, one thing maybe you've learned from this session. Hey, um, Bruce, can I, I just want to jump in just because uh, the cost question to me is, is really interesting. I would just like to hear, I mean, so we know in the case of third party distributors, like the cost is, it's the commission plus just the additional kind of resource to could manage that and so forth. So that's pretty clear. 
I think when you talk about measuring the cost of direct, I'd just like to hear your thoughts on how you do that, because that's not simply, okay, how much do I spend on Google and what's the conversion? It's not simply what I spend on Facebook. It's, you know, you're spending time on your, there's a lot of kind of sunk kind of fixed costs. So I'd love to hear, especially because we've got co companies of such different, kind of different uh, markets and sizes, how do you each approach that? So, I don't know, I'll, I'll let you all figure out who wants to go first, but. Hey Kelly, how about if you take that on? I mean, this sounds like the question we talked about regarding spending time on brand versus spending time on um, digital marketing. And I think we came up with, maybe we spend six times the amount on branding and messaging than we do on digital marketing. Um, but our brand is our mission. So it's at the forefront of everything that we do. Um, it does make us a little bit different, but yeah, we absolutely put a great deal of time and effort, um, careful effort in remaining relevant and scientifically um, accurate and ensuring our education and conservation programs are going to engage a high number of people that they are then gonna take home with them, those lessons learned, and then ultimately refer us to a friend or come back for more. So your marketing spend is more brand versus yeah. conversion, but I think Douglas's question was more, how do you evaluate the cost of paying a, a commission to an OTA to a direct sale? Like, which one is really more expensive? Does anyone uh, want to take that? You know, I don't think, for us, we haven't necessarily totally delve into that space because we, we don't put them in the same buckets and we don't look at them the same way. Marketing is marketing and, and this is a sales process. So, um, and again, we can look at, when we look at the, the client mix from Italy and Spain and Germany and France and um, the UK and knowing what that cost would be even when we compare it to our own search and market, search engine marketing, knowing that those costs would be higher. Um, it kind of balances out. And so we do, trust me, we have a whole e-commerce team that pays attention to where those ads are coming up. We have a, a robust um, marketing team and a revenue team that analyzes um, mainly where our booking cycles more than we do necessarily how much are we spending one versus the other. But it's so important, right? So Gus, you have the data, right? Well, um, I look at, um, marketing to build brand um, along the lines of maybe buying Google ads to drive traffic to my site. And what I've learned is there's some products on my website that um, work really well for me to book direct, but then there's some products that I can buy a lot of Google ads and people won't book direct. So I choose to push those products to the OTAs and not chase after um, trying to buy ads for those types of customers. Um, does that make sense? Well, it all makes sense, but okay. no one's answered the question, but that's okay. <laughs> um, so, but basically you're saying different product, different segments of people will give you a different idea of whether to go and push direct versus third party. Or maybe um, I'm better at selling some products on my own and the OTAs are better at selling some of my products for me. So it's not even a financial decision, it's just getting no. the business in the door. Yeah. Yeah. I will say that um, two weeks ago, we had 104 different affiliates that we were working with, and we cut 56 just last week. So yeah, we're seeing that it's become incredibly expensive for us. So to let's go to that question. If we could get the slide up that showed the results of the poll and why we see that, let's talk about that. I mean, how many distributors should you work with? We have about 60 here at Arrival. You, Kelly, went from 104 to about half. Yes. Why? And uh, the commissions, yeah, we just wanted to, we, we are at a place right now where our in-house reservations agents are having a hard time selling our own seats. So we want some of our business back um, and we want some of that commission back. So that's an inventory situation, is that what you mean? Like you could have sold more direct but you would already put them out through distributors. Yeah. So it's, it's inventory, which I assume you have, you, inventory issues. Yeah, I mean, I only have so many tour spots to fill. And so for me right now, working with more OTAs doesn't make sense. And I, I feel bad for the team at Magpie because they've been contacting <laughs> me and trying to get me on their platform. I love the idea. It's just not worth my time right now. So kind of maybe to talk about the ROI, it is actually more beneficial for me to spend time 
you know, reaching out to women's organizations or moms groups or um, summer camps and Girl Scout troops than to spend time on an OTA site developing my description. Right. Um, because I know for a fact, I mean, one of my first, and no one really talks about direct mail anymore, but one of my first campaigns, it was truly a flyer. I hand wrote my signature on it saying, hope to see you on a tour. It cost me $100 in copies and postage, and I got three private tours out of it, and that was $6,000. So, and I got, I can count on two hands the number of bookings I've got through Expedia in five years. Liz, how many distributors do you work with? Uh, hundreds. Um, hundreds. But I'm also going to put receptive tour operators in that mix, too, because we're talking direct, non-direct. Um, OTAs, probably 40 plus. 40 OTAs. Yeah. Okay. So. And how do you decide which ones to work with, which ones that maybe you don't want to spend your resources on? We pretty much give everybody a try, and then when we, if we don't get traction, then we kind of leave them by the wayside and we don't pay attention to them. So, so it's the, all about whether they produce or not. Whether they produce yeah. or not, yeah. Gus, how many distributors do you work with? Um, under 10. And again, how do you decide which ones? There's 60 here. They all would probably love to sell your products. Um, I look at... Um, the areas that they, you know, focus on. We just started working with um, an OTA called Trip Shock that focuses on the southern part of the United States, and that seemed like a good mix for us because we're located in the southern part of the United States. So I see if they can bring something unique to the table, and if they can, we work with them. Also, lots of 30% um, of our passengers don't speak English, so we're always looking for international OTAs. Um, we work with CETUS, and that's been very good for us. So under 10, and those are the main ones that we work with. So interesting, if you look at the slide, 39%, the biggest number on the slide, work with or do more than 80% of their business through distributors. That's a direct, big number. Direct. No, direct. So distributors, you're okay. <laughs> no, direct. It's not what it says? Am I reading that wrong? <laughs> what percent? Oh, maybe I didn't read the top. What percentage of your sales are direct? Okay. Sorry about that. I didn't read that right. So... It is 39% do more than 80% direct. That's what that slide is saying. And then you can read there. So it's a reverse. <laughs> yeah. Let's talk about something else, working with OTAs especially, which is the billboard effect, which is a pretty big deal in the hotel world. Um, the, the research I've seen is that approximately 65% of hotel bookings start on an OTA site and then end up being a direct booking. Right? So for those of you who don't know the billboard effect, it means someone goes to a website, figures out where they want to stay, in our case, what they want to do, and then they go and book direct. So the OTA, while not making a commission on that, really helped you get that sale. And there's a lot to be said for that. Yeah. Um, what do you guys think of that? Well, I guess I, I sort of touched on this earlier. Um, we have uh, many passengers contacting us saying, I saw you on Expedia, and can you tell me what you offer? And we'll tell them, and sometimes they say, thanks a lot, I'm going to go book on Expedia now. <laughs> so, um, but I believe strongly in, in um, a, you know, like I said, making strong claims, fine-tuning our descriptions on the OTA sites, and piquing people's curiosity so that they find us on their own. And it happens every day. Um, some of my tours I post on Airbnb experiences, and... I have a love-hate relationship with them, but the reason I also do it is I also know that a good number of executive assistants and office managers are use, are young, they're in their 20s, and they're, looking, they're tasked with organizing their team building experiences. So they're on Airbnb looking for things to do. They reach out to me via the Airbnb platform, and this might really bug Ricardo, but <laughs> I immediately bring them to me directly, and I have them book through my website. <laughs> Sorry, Bruce, Ricardo. Bruce, we have another question from the audience here. <laughs> yeah. Hello. Uh, my name is Gabe Badeau. I'm with Georgia Aquarium. Um, so my question is for these OTA partners that you're working with, are you taking vouchers from them or are you issuing like live inventory? Like how is it that you're distributing your product through them specifically? You want to start with that, Liz? Um, currently... 
Um, we have one API connection. We're pretty much voucherless. We get notifications, everything that, that we um, book. I would say 95%. There might be some sightseeing tours that we can do walk-ups for, but by the nature of our business, because it's dining, we need a reservation. We get advanced booking, then issue the, and then make the reservation. The guests can come up with or without a voucher because we've already had that electronic copy or validation that, that they're booked and we'll get paid on that. Kelly? Unique URLs and telephone numbers. So we track them that way. On a mobile device? So um, no paper? Uh, no, no paper, all no. mobile. So it's like a mobile voucher, mm -hmm. basically. OK, one more question. Um, I'd like to start with you, Gus, and then work our way down. Just give me a very quick answer. Your number one idea of how operators can grow direct business. Um, they, uh, companies relate to us. They relate to our origin story. We, um, that's the number one thing you can do. Your website is your most powerful marketing tool you have, and you can't work hard enough on telling your story and expressing your values to those people looking for you. Kelly? Yeah, I completely agree. Um, make it an experience over a product and continually tell that story, the story of your passengers, yeah, the story of the people that are having those experiences with you. I say you know your business and your company or your customer best. So who is coming on your tour, Using that, use that data to figure out how to get to those people. And also don't be afraid of sharing who you are. I've mentioned that I'm a mom twice. On all my marketing materials, it says created and owned by an East Bay mom. That really resonates with locals. Yeah. And Liz. So um, really trying to be our own advocate and trying to refresh our products in a way that we can make more kind of social media stories, Instagrammable moments. Um, we've just implemented a new kind of birthday club to kind of refresh to get to the local market as well, kind of some unique ideas of, of how to draw in, in our local direct um, small group and, and individual sales. So, so local. 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 Yeah. Hey, Bruce, before we wrap up, I'm sorry, I know you had one more question, but I'm going to just throw one more because because Gus, you just said something interesting a while back that I, I felt like the thread wasn't quite closed. So you said you basically you switched your, your third party versus direct mix, kind of 70, 30. But you didn't say how, and you didn't also say like what was the impact like. Did, you, did your sales dip or did they continue to grow? And what about your, your profit? So I'd just like to know what was the, what was the magic trick and what happened to sales and what happened to, uh, to profit? Um, well, we found a lot of ways to add value to our passengers. We offer free bottled water. We offer free luggage storage. We offer free hotel pickup. We offer a free souvenir map. We try to appeal to families and let them know that we're going to have a sticker pack for kids. And you, so you only offer these things on your website and you don't make them available through the products you offer on OTAs? Is that what you're saying? Um, Sort of, yes. <laughs> I, I sort of allude to them on the OTA site, maybe wondering, am I going to get this or not? And then they come to our website, and without a doubt, they're going to get a free sticker pack. Mm -hmm. But they're not necessarily going to get them if they book on an OTA. I just, just No, they do get them with the OTA. That, all that would lead to is bad reviews. So um, free Wi-Fi if you book direct, but if you happen to come from Expedia, we'll give you a free Wi-Fi password as well. And, and when you made this... <laughs> <laughs> Something new, okay, and, then, <laughs> and, and so when you saw the switch, so did, did you take a sales hit in order to grow profits, or were, did sales, were you able to grow your direct sales enough that revenue and profitability grew? And, well, what happened to profitability? Um, I, to me, more sales means more profitability if you're running your business right and your prices are in line. I'm so was it more sales? The question is, yes, sales more sales. Grew. Yeah. Direct, How much has sales, sales grown this yeah. year from a year ago today? Yes. About what percent? Um, well, I, like I said, I looked at the, it before, um, I just know that it was 50-50 OTA direct, and now it's about 75-25 direct. And I don't sales, know the exact. You don't know how much sales increased? I don't. That's okay. Okay. Ladies and gentlemen, Gus Moore, Kelly McHugh, Lauren McCabe-Herpick, and Liz Gilbert.